Rosie the Riveter, the housewife turned defense worker. When her husband went to war, she answered the patriotic call and took up his job in the factories of America. She is a symbol not only of the patriotic devotion of the American home front, but also of female empowerment. But did she really exist? And now, a word from our sponsors. Hey kids, 9 out of 10 doctors recommend joining the Time Ghost Army. This is On Your Home Front, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Anna Deinhardt. When America enters World War II, its government fears a labor shortage is on the horizon. So in April 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt establishes the War Manpower Commission. It doesn't have the power to make people sign up for work or employers to take them. Instead, it must work out in a way to inspire good Americans to answer the patriotic call and join effort on the home front. Being a large pool of labor resources, women are obviously one of their main targets. It's not like women didn't already work. In fact, the percentage of women in work was steadily increasing. In 1890, 5% of women held paid jobs. By 1940, it was 28%. That's 12 million women workers, making up roughly 26% of the total labor force. But most working women only have jobs considered appropriate for their gender. For white women, that means being a teacher, a nurse, a social worker, or something in civil service. For black and Hispanic women, it usually means being a domestic servant. And they are all overwhelmingly young and single. Once they get married, their lives and paid employment are usually over. Because the ideal American woman isn't an employee, she's a wife and a mother. In 1942, the Ladies' Home Journal conducts a survey among sailors and soldiers to find out what the ideal woman looks like. And here's what they found out. She is healthy and vital, maybe even a trifle plump. No languid beauties for these lads. She's devoted to home and children, although she can take part in at least one outdoor sport and likes a moderate amount of dancing. Business ability and braininess run a mighty poor second to a talent for cooking. A college education isn't necessary, and most young men would prefer not to have their wives work after marriage unless an emergency made it desirable. It's the job of the WMC to convince men and women alike that such an emergency is now. This they share with the domestic branch of the Office of War Information, established in June to centralize propaganda efforts, although the American government don't like to admit its propaganda. Anyway, together the WMC and the OWI come up with a riveting campaign. The WMC organized nationwide publicity campaigns, which are to be backed up by local recruitment drives. To support the nationwide campaign, the OWI organized special shows and celebrity announcements for radio. They produce woman power short films, request magazines to run cover stories of women workers, and work with the War Advertising Council to insert their message into consumer marketing. How do you like your job, Mrs. Stoner? I love it. Isn't this pretty hot for you, Miss Pelaine? Well, I hear it gets kind of hot around the kitchen stove, too. I never thought of that. Yes, and it gets pretty hot out there in the South Pacific. The primary targets here are middle-class white housewives, or soon-to-be housewives. Poorer women or black or minority women don't figure that much in government-approved messaging. And how do campaign planners try to convince the housewives to take up work? First is the appeal of higher wages, equal to what men receive. <laughs> Although the government does quickly caution that this promise shouldn't risk inflation or the idea of an easy war. Obviously. So instead, the major appeal is to American women periodic duty. This can range from the positive to the negative. For example, a March 1943 campaign has the slogan, the more women at work, the sooner we'll win. 
But supplementary reading materials then have quotes like every idle machine may mean a dead soldier. The negative reinforcements goes even further than that. An OWI campaign directive states that women should be given the following message. Eventually, the neighbors are going to think it very strange if you're not working. They'll be working too. In fact, any strong, able-bodied woman who is not completely occupied with a job and a home is going to be considered a slacker just as much as the man who avoids the draft. This tactic isn't without controversy and many female government officials object to it. But the WMC and OWI press on. Appearing all around the US are poster captions like Longing won't bring him back sooner, get a war job, and the girl he left behind is still behind him. Hollywood movies like Swing Shift Maisie and Conquer the Clock help to normalize women having jobs. So do popular songs like The Lady at Lockheed and We're the Janes Who Make the Planes. One popular song goes, while other girls attend their favorite cocktail bar, sipping dry martinis, munching caviar, there's a girl who's really putting them to shame. Rosie is her name. It's called Rosie the Riveter and it will inspire one of the most famous images of the war. On May 29, 1943, Memorial Day, the Saturday Evening Post runs a cover story illustrated by the famous Norman Rockwell. He depicts a muscular Rosie taking a lunch, breaking while a huge rivet gun sits on her lap. A copy of Mein Kampf is at her feet. But this image of a tough Rosie is somewhat of an outlier. Because while advertisers are keen to recruit women to work, they are also keen to remind them that they are still women and should look and act the part. Take this August 1943 ad for lipstick. It's a reflection of the free democratic way of life that you have succeeded in keeping your femininity, even though you are doing a man's work. If a symbol were needed of this fine, independent spirit, of this courage and strength, I would choose a lipstick. A woman's lipstick is an instrument of personal morale that helps her to conceal heartbreak or sorrow, gives her self-confidence when it's badly needed, heightens her loveliness when she wants to look her loveliest. No lipstick, ours or anyone else's, will win the war but it symbolizes one of the reasons why we are fighting. The precious fight of women to be feminine and lovely under any circumstances. So instead of Rockwell's Rosie, another wartime image might better depict the ideal working women. J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It Girl. It features an attractive young woman rolling up her sleeves, ready to work. But even this isn't the standard rosy you might think it is. For one, it's not a piece of government propaganda, but a creation of a single company, Westinghouse Electric. They've displayed it in-house for just two weeks to motivate already employed workers. So, a dramatic call to America's women, it is not. And while Miller's Rosie is beautiful, she also looks tough something inconsistent with most depictions of women workers at the time. Because, as a writer reminds her fellow women in a guidebook for women war workers, you must admit, for it is a well-established fact that you are a vain creature. And all the factory jobs in the country, whatever their other compensations, would not appeal to you if you had to appear before your fellow workers wearing some simply horrid looking thing and magazines are keen to remind women workers that beauty on a production line is possible. In October 1943, the Women's Home Companion will even try to prove this by taking four women war workers to Hollywood to have them made up, outfitted and photographed like models. Some factories even have beauty salons and makeup mirrors so their rosies can touch up the glamour on the job. As a side note, 
Between 1940 and 1945, retail cosmetic sales will have increased by 63%. But the question now is, did American women respond to the patriotic call? Did they put on lipstick and a hard hat and get to work? Well, by the end of the war, 19 million women will be working in America. That's a 9% increase from the 12 million working in 1940, representing a 12% increase in the share of the total labor force. But there is a catch. When you factor in population growth and that already established trend of increasing female workers, the numbers of those responding to the trumpet's call is only somewhere between 2.7 to 3.5 million. And the vast majority of working women are not rosies. They are much more likely to work as secretaries or clerks. If they do work in the war industries, they are in relatively low-skilled jobs like welding or being on the assembly line. Employers just aren't willing to train women in skilled work, especially as their employment will only be temporary. Because all the government campaigning for women war workers stress it that it is only for the duration. How about after the war? Are you going to keep on working? I should say not. When my husband comes back, I'm going to be busy at home. Well, this job belongs to some soldier. And when he comes back, he can have it. Oh, that's swell. And sure enough, when the war begins to wrap up, American culture will again valorize the housewives and remind women that they should dutifully make way for the returning soldier. By 1950, the female share of the total labor force will have reverted back to the long-term trend of the pre-war days. So what can we make of Rosie the Riveter? Well, it seems like she was just a myth. She wasn't born out of an actual societal change, but rather a government campaign from the top. And it was a campaign that didn't lead to that many new women workers anyway, especially ones in the defense industry. Still, for the first time in American history, the ideal woman could be both beautiful and blue jeans wearing. She wasn't only a housewife, but also a worker whose labor provided for herself her family and her nation. And the Rosies as imagined by Rockwell and Miller will one day take on a life of their own, inspiring future generations to roll up their sleeves and show men they can do just as good a job as them. They might say even a better one. To see a video where I talk of how Germany had too few people playing doctor at the beginning of the war, click here. Join the Time Ghost Army to get more of me and the rest of the crew. Subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell. Yeah, what? Yeah, what?